Well, let's pray. Lord, as we, as we have heard and as we continue to hear your word, scriptures for us this morning, Lord, we pray your spirit would guide us, would give us ears to hear, eyes to see who we are and who you are in Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. So this morning, um, I want to start off by asking you a question. Uh, you don't have to answer out loud, uh, but just think for a minute uh, how you would answer. The question is, who are you? Who are you? Think about how you would answer that question. There are, there are lots of different ways to kind of approach that question, aren't there? Right? For some of us, we may, we may first think of, uh, of what we do for a living, right? I, I'm an artist, I'm a student, I'm a computer programmer, I'm a teacher. Or we may think of it in terms of what our hobbies are, or our likes and dislikes. I'm a Patriots fan. I don't like the Yankees. I'm a Star Wars fan. I'm a golfer. I'm a stamp collector. I'm someone who enjoys cooking or gardening, right? We can answer, answer that question with, with those sorts of answers. Or maybe we, we hear that question and we think of, think of it in terms of our, of our personality or, or the characteristics we see in ourselves, right? I'm, I'm outgoing in the life of the party. Or, right, or who am I? Well, I'm a, I'm a quiet person who likes time to myself. Or, who am I? I'm kind. I'm a kind and generous person. Or maybe it's a little more nuanced, right? Who am I? Well, I'm someone who wants to be kind and generous, but I'm really just someone who has a hard time living up to that. Or maybe, and maybe this is because of where you happen to be this morning when I asked you that question, right? This is where you're sitting right now. Your first thought to that was, was a good church answer, right? Who am I? I'm a child of God. Or I'm a sinner redeemed by Christ. Or maybe even it was, I'm here, but I'm just trying to figure this all out. Right now, the thing is that, that all of those ways of, of thinking about that question, those are all good and fine ways to, to approach it, right? All of those angles to that question are, they all try to get at different aspects of who we are, because we are, all of us, we are, we are multifaceted, complex people, right? And so there are any number of ways to approach an answer to that question. Well, where we are now in our look at the, the New Testament book of Hebrews, which we've been going through this summer, uh, where we are now in this book offers us another way to look how to answer this question. And it's a way, I don't, uh, I don't know if this is so much a, a northern thing, but definitely a, a southern thing. I'm, I'm from Virginia, and um, down south, it's not, not uncommon to get the question, who are your people? Right? When someone wants to know, know about who you are, one thing they'll, they'll want to know is, well, who are your people? Right? So, so one way I might answer that question you know, if someone says, Kevin, who are you? I might say, well, these are my people. I'm the husband of Rachel, the father of Ezra, the son of Brian and Dee White. Uh, just, uh, yes, no, two days ago, um, Ezra got a letter from, from my parents, from Grandma and Grandma. In this letter uh, were pictures of me in middle school. And they sent Ezra these pictures because Ezra is beginning middle school this year. And so he got a letter from Grandma and Grandpa with pictures of me, his dad, the guy he's taken to calling the old man recently. <laughs> um, he had pictures of me in middle school. And uh, well, let me just say, I am so thankful we don't have screens here, so I wasn't even tempted to put those pictures up. Um, but rest assured that Rachel and Ezra thoroughly enjoyed looking at those pictures, right? right? But one of the things that that said, that was in a way, my parents, his grandma and grandpa, reminding him 
that he is the experience, what he is about to experience. He's going off to middle school. His dad went off to middle school, and this is who his dad was at the time, haircut and all. Right? This is this is who he is, and so it was a way of inviting Ezra to see who he is as he goes off to middle school, as part of something bigger, as part of of, of me. Of his part, his story is a part of my story, and my story is a part of his story. Is connecting this, um, right? That who you are. Involves who your people are. Right? So, so that is one powerful way to answer that question. Who are you? Right? And not just by birth or genealogy, but who we are connected to even by choice, right? Who our people are by choice, right? Whose company do we keep? What communities are we a part of? And right, this is this is a powerful way to think about who we are. These are these connections inform so much of who we are. Right? Is it, did anyone ever had their parents say when you, when you were a kid, say something like, um, like that may be what your friends are doing, but we don't do that. Anyway, I'm seeing some people nodding. Yeah, anybody, anybody hear that, right? The idea being that, that being a part of, of this community, in this case maybe a family, that do that this is this is there's expectations, part of being who you are acting in this way, or thinking this way, or doing this, right? right doing this or, or not doing that is, is a part of what it means to, to be a part of or be among this particular community. Right now, sometimes maybe with a, a club or whatever, that can mean we don't do this, so if you do, you're out. But other times, and, and hopefully this is the case with families, right? For example, it can be be more of a call when they say we don't do that. It's a call and a reminder to live, to live into what is true and defines you as, as a member of this community because being a member also defines who you are. That's what's going on in this section of Hebrews that we are coming to today. The Bible as a whole gives us a, a whole host of ways to approach this question of, of who are you or maybe just as often, if not more, who are we? Here in Hebrews, it's approaching it from this angle, this perspective of, of who are you? Of who are your people? So what I want to do for, for most of the rest of the time here is, uh, is say a few words about, about what leads into this part of Hebrews, and then, and then we're going to look at Hebrews chapter 11 and just a little bit of, of chapter 12. But we're going to do it a little bit differently. Um, as we've been looking at this New Testament book, I've, I've been encouraging us to see it, uh, to see Hebrews, uh, and, and this is nothing new that I came up with. I'm standing on the shoulders of, of many uh, who have come before me and are much smarter than me, but, but inviting us to, to see this primarily, the book of Hebrews, we see it primarily as what it really seems to have been, not just a letter, but a sermon, and a sermon preached to a particular early Christian congregation or group of congregations. A sermon preached to this group of Christians who had, who had grown weary, whose faith was being worn and tested by, by perhaps some major trials or maybe even just a daily grind of life. But this was a sermon preached to these people in this particular context. And this chapter that we come to today, chapter 11, this is part of, of this larger ancient sermon, and it in and of itself is a shining example of why we should, we should hear this as a sermon more than anything else. And so I'm going to say a word about the context, how we, how we get right here, and then rather than, than read this passage and then preach on it, I'm primarily, I'm primarily just going to preach this passage, right? So this morning, if you are if you are one who likes to read along in your in your Bible at church, um, maybe this morning don't do that, right? You maybe come back to it and read it over later today. But this morning, right now, I invite you just to, to listen, because this passage is a sermon to us. So here's the context. 
Leading into chapter 11, the, the preacher of Hebrews here is encouraging his congregation not to fall away in their, in their weariness, but to persevere. He does this by reminding them, reminding his congregation who they are. He does that by reminding them who their people are. We, he says, the end of chapter 10. We are not among those who shrink back and so are lost, but among those who have faith and so are saved. Now faith, he goes on to proclaim to his congregation. Now faith. Now faith, Calvin, Presbyterian Church. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith, our ancestors received approval. By faith, we, family, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. Through this, he received approval as righteous. God himself giving approval to his gifts. Now, he died. But through his faith, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death, and he was not found because God had taken him. For it was attested before he was taken away that he had pleased God. And without faith, family, without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Not, by the way, those who get it right all the time, or maybe even most of the time, but those who seek him. By faith, Noah. Warned by God about events yet unseen, respected the warning and built an ark to save his household. By this he condemned the world and became an heir to the righteousness that is in accordance with faith. By faith, Hamlet, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he set out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he stayed for a time in the land that had been promised, as in a foreign land, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him, the same promises. By faith, he received power of procreation, even though he was too old, and Sarah herself was barren, because he considered him faithful who had promised. Therefore, one person, this one as good as dead. From this one person, descendants were born, as many as the stars in the heavens and as innumerable as the grains of sand by the seashore. Brothers and sisters, all of these, they died in faith without having received the promises. From a distance, from a distance, they saw and greeted them. They confess that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For people who speak in this way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Now if they had been thinking of the land they had left behind, well, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, family, they desire a better country. That is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Indeed, he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when put to the test, he offered up Isaac. He who had received the promises, ready to offer up his only son, the very one of whom he'd been told is through Isaac, the descendants shall be named for you. For he, family, and hear me in this, he considered the fact that that God is able to even raise someone from the dead. Figuratively speaking, mind you, he did receive him back, didn't he? By faith, Isaac invoked blessings for 
the future on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions about his burial. By faith, Moses, Moses was hidden by his parents for three months after his birth they saw that the child was beautiful and they were not afraid of the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he was grown, he refused to be called a son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to share ill treatment with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. He considered abuse suffered for Christ, the Messiah, to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt for he was looking ahead to the reward. So by faith, Moses left Egypt unafraid of the king's anger, for he persevered as though he saw him who is invisible. By faith, by faith, he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch firstborn Israel. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven, seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were unbelieving because she had received the spies in peace. And, and what more, family, what more should I say up here, right? We could go on and on and on. But time would fail us to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, and Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets. There's prophets who, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, on one strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies Light. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking, flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were tempted, and they were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, Torment, whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in caves and in holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, they did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not part from us, family. So that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. I may. So that their faith, their witness, family, it would not be brought to its fullness unless it had been passed on and received, unless the baton is handed over and the race continues to be run by us. Though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better, so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. They would not, apart from us, receiving and joining in and running with that inheritance have the witness of their faith reach its fulfillment. Therefore, therefore, family, since we, Calvin Presbyterian Church, therefore, since we, Deanna, Roger, Robin Elkin, Fran, Judy, Rachel, Ezra, therefore, since we, Brad, Derek, therefore, since we, Josh, Walter, Judy, therefore, since we are surrounded by 
so great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight of sin that so easily clings so closely, so that, that so easily distracts, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, all of us together looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the sake of the joy set before him, endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. So here's that question again. Who are you? Because these are your people. And Jesus himself is the pioneer and the perfecter of the faith that unites you. The one who will bring to all its fullness your faith and countless others, bringing to completion the stories and witness of all the faithful. And you are among. You are a part of those who have inherited so great a faith. These are your people. These are our people through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Because all of us in Christ, we all have fellowship with God through the Spirit. And so these are our people. All those fellowship with God through the Spirit, therefore fellowship with one another. These are our people. So let us therefore, because we know who we are by this company that we keep, and we know who we are by this company that keeps us. So yes, there may be times when knees get weak, hands begin to droop, now we know who we are. So let us therefore run with perseverance the race that is set before us for Jesus, the one whose company keeps all of us. He is the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, the beginning and the end, the one in whom all of our stories and lives and faith is held. Remember, family, remember the company that you keep. And above all, remember the company that keeps you. So that we too may run this race in such a way that the inheritance continues on and on and on until Jesus himself brings all to its fulfillment. Remember who you are. Let's pray. Lord, for the gift, the witness, the lives of so many faithful that have gone before us, who have spoken words of hope and promise, your words of hope and promise into our lives, for those who have passed the baton, for we give you thanks. Therefore, may we have the strength to run that race, that their faith may be brought to its fulfillment, that we may pass it on, that our faith may be brought to its fulfillment, for all finds its fulfillment in Jesus Christ the one who keeps all of our company, holds our faith, indeed our lives, in his hands. Lord, we thank you for such a gift. Amen.